Hi everyone, welcome again. Another edition of our T3 live streams tonight. Uh, we're very excited. We've got a couple of special guests who are going to join us in our first uh, double player edition. Steph Catley and Dean Bazana. Steph, Dean, how are we? Hi. Good, thanks. All good, mate. How's everything been? You know, there's obviously, uh, we're all kind of easing out of these restrictions. You know, for athletes, it's been, you know, a, a pretty challenging couple of months. Uh, from your point of view down there in Melbourne, both playing for Melbourne City, how's uh, how's life been in isolation? Um, yeah, look, it's been tough, obviously. Um, both being professional footballers and, you know, having a routine every day and going in and sticking to a strict routine, it's uh, it's been very different. But, you know, luckily we're both professional footballers and uh, we both want to remain sharp and remain fit. So we've been doing our own sessions uh, together uh, maybe five times a week and just, you know, getting out, staying active and uh, just doing what, what we need to do to remain fit. Excellent. What about from your point of view, Steph? Obviously, you know, you've got nothing on in terms of games, matches, as Dean alluded to, keeping yourself fit. Is there anything else, any other hobbies you might have picked up in the past couple of months, something you didn't know about yourself even, what you enjoy? Yeah, I mean, it has been a really strange experience, especially, as you said, because I'm, I'm not playing at all and don't have really games to go back to. So it's yeah. been a real limbo and just kind of trying to stay fit and enjoy different parts of sport. I've been doing, like, a lot of Pilates and different things like that, but yeah. I also study, so that's kept me really busy and um, I've actually become a lot better at that when I don't have yeah. training. <laughs> yeah, of course, because that's the biggest thing, you know, You know, giving athletes a kind of, in a, in a way, used to the camp mentality of being at home and being alone, but maybe not to this level and limit, and like Dean, you talked about your, your structure that you're used to having. Is there anything that you've sort of looked to implement? You know, you've talked about maybe the physical side of games, Pilates, but to try and keep yourselves in a way, you know, sane given this time of, of sitting at home and, and not doing much? Yeah, look, like we're not the type of people to, to sit at home all day and lounge around. We want to be out there fueling and getting a sweat on, you know. So yeah. I've been focusing a lot on the uh, strength work, uh, lower body strength work to, to maintain that and, I actually feel a little bit stronger at the moment because I've been doing a lot more than I have been during the season because obviously in the season you've got to prepare for games and uh, doing some runs. But, you know, Steph and I, you know, I play a lot of tennis. Uh, Steph does things with her friends on a, on a weekly basis where she meets her friends for, for dinners and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's been challenging. Um, but, yeah, we're, we're getting through it. Yeah, hopefully closer to the other side than we are to the start of it. So, well, yeah, in terms of you, Steph, I mean, you've obviously you've got a heavy schedule given the different sort of leagues you play in, the obviously requirements for the Matildas as well. Has this maybe been a little bit of a time that you don't normally get? I know it's a, probably a longer period than we want um, to kind of recover, reset, you know, get ready for what comes ahead in the future in the next sort of 12, 18 months. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm usually going from the W League in Australia to America straight away, back to back, and I've been doing that for the last seven years. So yeah. I don't know what an off season is. So this yeah. has been quite strange for me. He's always telling me just to chill out and just to relax because yeah. I I can't mentally deal with this long of a break. I've, yeah. I know that we're supposed to have it and it's supposed to feel good, but it just because I haven't had it in so long, it's pretty. It's just gives me a lot of anxiety not knowing what to do and not knowing when I'm going to play again. It's just a lot. But I'm slowly coming to terms with it and trying to enjoy it a little bit. And it has been the biggest blessing in disguise for my body because I've, yep. I've actually stopped and been able to sort of, you know, reassess and um, do what I need to for my body. So that's been really nice. Excellent. So welcome everyone who's joined us here on the live stream tonight. As we said, we, we've got a little bit of a different format with two players, both a male and female player for Melbourne City who are going to be with us. And, and now we're going to sort of move and shift our conversation a little bit to the why behind becoming a professional, you know. Dean, we'll start with yourself grow, growing up in southern Sydney uh, and coming through the ranks at a couple of junior clubs there. What was it that got you involved in football from the start? Um, and what was what was it about football that gave you the spark to obviously want to go on and progress as you got older? 
Yeah, uh, look, ever since I can remember, I've, uh, I've always had a football with me. Um, my dad has a big passion for soccer. Um, he, 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 he loves the game and he's always been involved in the game and, um, you know, just playing out the street and uh, kicking a football at, at school and stuff like that, you know, my dad had an eye and, and seeing that I had, had, a, had a bit of a talent and from there I started to uh, grow and love the game because for me, like when you're a younger uh, player or younger boy or girl, I think you need to enjoy the game first and foremost because you might have uh, an outstanding ability but it might not be your passion and I had that passion. I loved the game. I remember uh, my favourite player was Ronaldinho growing up because of the way that he even though he's not a goalkeeper, but even because <laughs> he played the game with the smile on his face and, you know, I mean, the way he played, it was like he was on the street, you know. So, and then as I, I started to grow up and, and, and then from going, uh, playing like uh, with your local club, I then trolled for, for obviously Sutherland Sharks and Sydney Olympic and in, in the representative stages and, and, and got selected and I thought, well, hang on, I've got a chance here as I got older. Yep. And, uh, you know, I've just... For me, football is is all I've ever known. I, I love the game, and you know, I, I watch endless games. I, I want to stay in the game after my career. So, I've just had that passion ever since I was a young boy. Yeah, excellent. So, Steph, what about you? Growing up in Melbourne, uh, obviously, given the way that the women's game, especially, has gone in the last sort of 10, 15 years, you know, starting off there, you know, talk to us about your journey. Did you originally play? in sort of mixed teams how did it sort of begin for you and and how did it progress into the youth football from the junior stuff yeah so uh growing up my older brother was my best friend my hero so everything that he did um i sort of just followed him around and we played every sport under the sun we'd do afl cricket we played mm -hmm. a lot of soccer in the backyard with the boys around the neighborhood um, but I was always the only girl, um, so from that made me a big tomboy and that always made me want to be better than the boys. Um, so I, I think initially my brother signed up to a club um, and he joined a team and I would just go down with mum when he was training and I'd yeah. dribble up and down the sideline in front of all the parents kind of showing off, you know, yeah. do my best tricks and my best dribbling. Um, and then eventually they threw me in with one of the boys' teams and I just fell in love with it. I, I just love the team aspect of it. I love what I loved when I was little, the fact that I could see myself getting better. The more that I trained, the more that I would put effort, effort into my training, the better I would get. And I, I sort of became obsessed with that. So um, yeah, I suppose that's why I fell in love with the game. And then um, from then on, uh, I suppose the representative teams came after that, but um, I was I loved playing with the boys. I played there till I was I think thirteen. Yep. Um, and my dad actually told me that uh, the coach had called and said that there was a girls' representative team that were interested in me trialing. And I ended, I, he told me that I was I was crying and I didn't want to leave the boys. <laughs> I didn't have a concept that there was that sort of thing because it yeah. took so long for the girls' programs to to kick off. And yeah. um, I think it, when even when I left the boys' club. Uh, for the club that I was at, there was no girls team there still. So um, these days you look at every football club and there's girls program. So it's just, it's come so far. Excellent stuff. So we've probably got a few local girl junior players from the Kensington Junior Soccer Club down in Melbourne, one of our partner clubs. So if you're here and you're online, post your questions that we can ask, ask Steph and Dean throughout tonight. So Dean, you talked obviously then about you know, your upbringing and whatnot. At what age was it that goalkeeping came into it? Was it before you hit representative football or after? When was it? Um, yeah, this is a really strange scenario because I had always been an outfield player to the age of uh, 14. So yeah. at the time I was um, I was at Senior Olympic and uh, uh, playing as an outfield player and uh, the goalkeeper uh, got got injured and I was the tallest of the team. I think I was the same size as I was now when I was 14. So they put me in goal and uh, I actually did all right. And my dad had played a bit of football in goals, you know, not at a high level, but that when he played with his mates or wherever he played, he yep. goal and he's seen something and he said, do you want to do sessions once or twice a week to see if you like it? And yep. I said, yeah, okay, why not? 
started and then I, that's when I really fell in love with goalkeeping. It took that one match to go in and being an outfield player the whole time, it was just, it happened so quickly um, because then from there I, pl- I went to St. George where I dropped down a division from the MPL to MPL 2 but mm-hmm. played a division higher. So I was fi- uh, under 15s but playing in the 16s but as a goalkeeper. Um, and within one year, I had uh, signed at Liverpool because, I don't know, yeah, right place, right time, uh, yep. raw talent, uh, good with my feet because I played so long on the outfield that I ended up getting that opportunity uh, so quickly. It just it, Honestly, it happened within a flash. It was that quick. How did that come about, that opportunity? Because that's obviously something that everyone talks about now is the amount of players that we've obviously got here you know, in the men's side of the game that aren't playing in the Premier League like they used to? I mean, you had the dream move going over to one of the biggest clubs in the world at 15, 16. How did that come about? Yeah, um, so I was playing in the under 16, which is an age above um, at St. George, and I was doing okay. I was making, obviously, errors and stuff, but, you know, I was doing okay. Uh, and then... The under twenties goalkeeper happened to to, to fall sick. Um, I think he had food poisoning or something. And the under eighteens goalkeeper at the time was normally you'd use the, the keeper from below and he'd jump up. He had to go somewhere. I think he had some family commitments. So I was the next in line. I ended up playing a game for the under twenties from sixteens to twenties, and I was, you know, I was scared, but I ended up playing and doing well. And there was an agent watching in it. Um, in the in, in the in the grandstand and from that game he just kept watching two or three games i had no idea and then after that he, he approached me and said i think i can take you to europe i think what you have your physical you know you, you're a big boy for your age and within uh, a couple of months uh i was overseas trialing yeah excellent stuff steph let's shift it back to you now for a little bit because you know as we talk about, and there's another issue, you know, with the men's side of the game that keep, people keep talking about, okay, there's not enough younger players playing, but it seems that, you know, for a league that's got, uh, you know, similar amount of teams in the W League, there's a lot of young players that come through. And you made your debut fairly early at 15, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So how did that sort of come about? I mean, you now jumped into from 13 into 15. It's a very short period of time to have such quick development from youth into senior football. Yeah, for sure. Um, it was actually an interesting setup because I made um, the NTC squad, I think at around 13 when I changed over to girls football and that representative squad I was talking about. And then from 13 to 15, I was training within the NTC, NTC program. So there was a younger girls group and then there was the Melbourne Victory NTC older girls group. And the coach of both was the same coach. So I had had, um, his name was Matt Shepard, and I had him, so from when I was around 13, and it sort of transitioned into the older girls' squad. Yep. Um, so every now and then we, we would train before them, and then he would tell a certain few players to stick around and train with the older girls. So it was back-to-back training, but um, yep. it was always a little bit scary, a little bit daunting. All the older girls would sort of yell at you. Yep. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was that's sort of how I made my transition in. And then eventually I just, uh, Matt told me to stay with the older girls. Yeah. Um, so I was training with them and I was training with them since I was 14. You have to be 15 to play in the W League. So once I turned 15, I made my debut. Yeah, um, yeah it all was a little bit of a whirlwind, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> For both of you, I guess, looking back now, and it's one thing that I guess, you know, when you're going through that journey, you probably don't really like really look at something that maybe you're doing or something maybe you're not doing. But what was what was something for either of you, and I'll start with you, Dean, that you think got you um, that opportunity so early on? You talked obviously about playing on the field and then the sudden change of goalkeeper, but there must have been something that you did that managed to really accelerate your development within those age groups. Yeah, look, I'm... Um I've always been a believer that if you work hard, you will reap the rewards. Um, and we, along with the love of the game, I've always been one to to, to do extra sessions. And uh, I remember when I was in school, Dad would take me out of school in the last period, and and I'd go <laughs> and train, uh, because 
I was missing, I, I would miss school, which, okay, wasn't the best thing, but he's seen something and I'd have to drive an hour and a half from Cronulla in Sydney, which, you know, to Park Lee yeah. at the time, which is, is a yeah. long drive and I was doing extra sessions. Um, I think the thing that helped me going on trial uh, to Europe was that I did stand out because I have the ability with my feet um, and I made sure to continue to work on that even though I, uh, I was fortunate enough to have that um, skill but you know I made sure that I had that to, to try and stand out and uh, I think just with along with hard work uh, training and and uh, being mentally prepared is, uh, is is the most important thing excellent Steph what about yourself yeah I would just say um, similar thing as I said earlier I once I fell in love with football I was obsessed with getting better and no matter where I was, whether it was raining or 36 degrees, I was outside kicking up against the wall. Um, a lot of my close friends when I was around 13, 14 were sort of in a similar mindset where they were just so dedicated to the game, so in love with it. All we wanted to do was play football. And I think those extra sessions and, I, I mean, I wouldn't even call them sessions because I was outside just having fun, kicking a ball with friends. Yeah. But I honestly think that time has has sort of formed my technique now. I, I put all those hours down to when I was younger to yeah. me being able to pass the ball well now because it was all set back then and the hours I put in obviously have helped me to where I am now. Yeah, excellent stuff. So I, I'm, I'm presuming, have you both watched The Last Dance? Yeah. <laughs> we just yeah. finished it. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's obviously the big hit at the moment and, and it's interesting because when we look at all these top, and we study a lot of, of footballers, but athletes in general who are top, top level, they have an element of adversity during their professional career that obviously is something that, uh, that they've got to overcome to reach that level of greatness that they get to. But when you actually look at their stories and you go even further back, especially with MJ as well, he talks about his brothers in the backyard who kind of beat up on him. Um, there's always some form of adversity you had to get through as a younger player through your formative years in the game or as you're developing through youth football. Was there anything either of you had to overcome at any given point um, to get you to obviously where, you, where you've got in your careers? Sure. Um, yeah, I suppose when I was really young and I was playing with the boys, there was a lot of um, parents and people that didn't think that I should be playing. Um, mm -hmm. If I ever got knocked down or hurt, they would basically just be like, well, she shouldn't be playing, get off the field. She obviously can't handle it with the boys. Um, my poor mum, my poor dad standing on the side, I had to bite their tongue a lot of the time or maybe <laughs> now and then. But it was pretty consistent and it's something, it's a mindset that's obviously changed these days. But that sort of, those comments and just pe older, older people, adults making you feel like, you weren't good enough just because yeah. I was a girl. Um, that definitely drove me to be as good, if not better than the boys all around me. And I think that's something that has um, never really changed in my mindset. Awesome. Dina? Yeah. Uh, the thing with me uh, that, that I struggled initially with was um, going from Australia to, to, to Europe, one of the biggest clubs in the world, and seeing how cutthroat it was. Um, you know, I was a 16, 17-year-old boy, but you treat it as a man that's played 300 games. They expect you to be, you know, a seasoned pro already. And, uh, you know, I struggled being away from home, um, uh, not seeing not having my family and friends. Um, and if I have a poor performance, you know, I had to learn very quickly in, uh, in the reserve grade where I had to learn very quickly how to deal with it. Um, and at the start, I struggled with that because I wasn't used to that pressure. I wasn't used to that, to, to them regarding you so highly. But, you know, I, I believed in myself. I believed that I was there for a reason, that that, 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 I, that wasn't a fluke, that I had worked hard in the past. Uh, but initially, that, that was, uh, was difficult for me, being away from home and, and dealing with the pressure of having to perform to your maximum every single day. Yeah. So you obviously went over at a very young age. I mean, family played a very big part for you in getting into football and falling in love with it and developing. What sort of role have they played from that day you moved overseas up until now? How, how have they sort of been your support network and, and through everything you've been through? 
Yeah, look, obviously coming from a, a Greek background, having a, a big Greek family that's very tight knit. At the time, being 16 years old, it was it was difficult for my mother, especially, to to, to let me go because you know I was a little baby and she didn't want me to go alone and, and stuff like that. Uh, Dad was a bit different. Dad was saying that no, he has to go, he will go. Uh, yeah. and when I left, uh, they were going to the extent that Dad was going to move his lawyer business to. To, to England, mum was going to move over, but you know, we had a chat, and I thought that that wasn't fair for the whole family my brother and sister who have got mm-hmm. their friends, their commitments, and their schooling at home. Um, yeah. But they've always been there for me, they've always looked after me. You know, we, we, we'd Skyped a lot, um, and they would come visit. I was fortunate enough to have uh, X amount of. Uh, flights to and from England from my from my family to come and they split it up so my dad would come for one month and then a couple months later my yeah. mum would come and so forth so yeah they, they did everything they could to make me settle in uh, but obviously being that young uh, it's still yeah. difficult being away from your family yeah of course Steph what about yourself I mean you've obviously like we talked about then you've come in very young into a senior setup um the game is like you said it's changed a lot in the last 10 years not only the way i guess probably players treat each other but how the sort of support networks that are for players outside there's a lot of support for players from different organizations and whatnot at the moment but what was it like for you being so young in and around a senior setup um and how did the ones around you help help further your development in that setup yeah for sure it's always um i felt like i was always the young player in around older players for a long, long time. Um, yeah. My my brother's always had a good sense of himself and a good sense of me. So he's always kind of one that I've looked up to in terms of he keeps me very humble and keeps me very grounded. Um, he's he's very good at looking at situations and um, being able to take the best out of things, but then also tell me, man, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself or whatever it is. He's very good at that. So. Um, yep. He's been a very important person in my life, and um, you know, growing up playing football, I, none of it would have been possible without my mum. She, um, you know, we didn't have a, a whole lot of money growing up, so some of those state trips back in the day to get to national championships were pretty right. expensive. And um, you know, she would fundraise and she would sell these chocolates, little chocolates in boxes, and yep. do basically whatever she could to get me to play there. Um, she was so dedicated and believed in me so much, would drive me from A to B no matter what. Um, so absolutely there's no chance that I would be where I am without my mom. That's it. That's a very good lesson for everyone who's listening tonight. There'll be lots of players sitting there with mum or dad, so make sure you thank them for all the driving they do for you out and about. Steph, as well, you were very young, you know, in football terms, you know, given that when you went to play in America, um, you went over at 19, 20 years old. Was that right? Yeah, I think I might have been 19. Sounds yeah. that right. They're going to going to a country that obviously it's a lot different compared to here. You know, America obviously considers their legal age, for instance, going out is 21 and that kind of thing, going into a completely different environment. How did you sort of adjust to living on the other side of the world being young as well? Yeah, to be honest, I look back at that move now and I'm so impressed with myself that I just went and, and did it. Like it was yeah. going to... Portland Thorns at the time, and they still are probably one of the biggest women's clubs um, in women's football. Uh, yeah. You know, at the time they had three or four of some of the best players in the world, um, a very senior squad. So for me going in, I was probably the youngest by maybe three, four years. Um, yeah. First time overseas, my first time playing in a full time professional league. Um, so it was very, very intimidating and my, the coach that was there was a really tough coach. Now, even today, he's one of the toughest coaches I've ever had. Yeah. Um, he demanded a very, very high standard and obviously so, that team was very senior, so everybody did a training. Um, so that was a, a massive, massive learning curve for me. I, I went over and I'd sort of been at the top of my game here in Australia and, um, you know, I'd played for the national team and, I went there and it was a, a definitely a reality check. Um, you know, I played the first couple of games and then eventually I got um, the coach took me off at half time and said, it's just not good enough. You need to be better. Um, and I, that, it, it was one of the hardest things that's happened to me in football, but mm. that moment made me such a better player. I went away, I worked. I wasn't, I didn't put in my head that I needed to, to rush to get back into the lineup, but I was yeah. going to do everything I could at every single session to make sure that I did. 
And then I went on for that from that season to get sort of a record number of assists and play every single minute. And I just, it, it was the, a massive turn for me in my career. Excellent. So now we're going to get into some of the questions because we've had lots coming through. So we're going to put a couple here up on the screen and, uh, and we'll go through the first one here. So hi, Steph. Did you think playing with the boys made you stronger mentally and physically? 100%. <laughs> even even after I finished playing with the boys, I ended up going back and playing with the NTC boys and training with them three or four times a week just because I wanted that mental edge and the physicality of training with boys. They're just all so competitive no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously there's physical attributes that make me need to be better. Yeah. Um, but definitely I... I would say to lots of girls, if you can, I and you want to be a little bit, you want to challenge yourself, that training with boys is definitely a big help. Yep. Excellent. So the next one we got coming up. Dean, how do you rate the atmosphere of the second leg of the 2014 AFC Champions League final in Saudi? Oh, good question. Um, I know you, Michael, so how are you, mate? Uh, <laughs> uh, that AFC final in Saudi Arabia against Al Hilal was the most incredible experience I have ever been a part of. Um, obviously, my favourite club, Liverpool FC, with their, they're renowned for having fantastic fans all over the world. Um, but this was earpiece, like the, the, the noise level was deafening. I remember going there uh, as you walk out onto the pitch two hours before kickoff, and there was eighty to ninety thousand people already in the stadium. Apparently they were there three hours before kickoff. And uh, I remember walking out there, checking the pitch and them booing from two hours before and the stadium is packed. Um, yeah, it was phenomenal. It was unbelievable. Even better after, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. God was on our side that day because uh, <laughs> we had about four penalty decisions go for us, but we'll take it. Awesome. Next one up. Do you have a special routine or superstition before a game? We'll start with you, Steph. Um, I definitely used to. I used to have a lot of weird superstitions. And then after a while, I realized that it's not going to change whether I win or lose. <laughs> it, happened. <laughs> it happened regardless. So a lot of them kind of went out the window. I would say the only routines I have are just performance-based. So what I eat before a game, what I eat, the night before and pre-game, they're, they're always the same. How much water I drink, hydrolyte, those kind of things. But yeah. that's probably it. I'm not that superstitious anymore. Dina? Yeah, I'm a little bit different. Uh, <laughs> I must wear my own white uh, Adidas socks, uh, small like socks, uh, and then cut my soccer sock. So I feel comfortable because I train in them uh, throughout the week, so I need to have the same socks that I train in when I play. Uh, and I also, uh, when I walk out, I will, I will touch my chest. I will then go to the goal. The assistant coach, Patrick Kisnorbo, must bring me the, the drink bottle. We then hug. I then hold the ball. The players will get in a, in a huddle, and I must be the last one in the huddle before I kick the ball to the coach. So What a drama That's queen. something that I <laughs> But if I don't do it, I feel weird. So Where did yeah. that come in? Like when's the first time you've been I know, it's weird. I just had to do it. Sorry? When did you start that? When was the first time you had to do that? Um, I think it was we my first game for, for, for City. I had, uh, obviously played against Wellington, came on in the 60th minute because Tommy uh, had to get sent off. And then the next game, Patrick Kisnorbo bring me uh, the drink against victory in the derby, and that's when Timmy scored from halfway and won 4-1. And um, you know, I think the huddle, I've just always done that. I've just always been yeah. last at the huddle. So those two combined um, from from about four and four years ago, really, when I started at City and Kiz Norbo now, he, he uh, gets a bit annoyed with it because he has to bring the drink. But we're, <laughs> it's, 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 a good, it's a good friend of mine too. He gets his little cuddle before the game. And, yeah, and, and, and then he struts back and yeah. takes in the crowd and they cheer. Yeah, yeah, enjoying it. What happened though when he was taking the team when you had to travel? Oh, when he wasn't there? No, he yeah, what didn't he? I think he had to. Was he taking the team a couple of weeks oh, ago? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the goalkeeper coach would then have to bring it. 
So yeah, to someone in. I can't, I can't get the gaffer who's filling in at the time to uh, <laughs> record a bottle too. That's a bit too much. Uh, that would be oh, great yeah. to see that one day. Awesome. All right. So next one, Max is asking this question. In your experience, what's the best thing you do to defeat self-criticism? Good question, Steph. You're up first. Um, yeah, I mean, it's always it's something that I've battled with and I feel like every elite athlete will vouch for that. Yeah. It's something that doesn't yeah. exactly just go away and it's what makes you a good athlete because you know how to be critical of yourself and that makes yeah. you be better. But there's definitely a level in, in which that can get too much. Um, and throughout my career, it's definitely ebbed and flowed. I think now I've got a great perspective on um, my games. And when I watch things back, I can I can say this is what I've done well and this is what I haven't. Um, but I think the most important thing is just during a game, being able to make a mistake and then get it out of your head and keep going. And that's been the biggest lesson that I've learned. Um, and I think the way that I've overcome that is just to focus on the next moment and make sure that I do it right the next time, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah good. Ben? Yeah, I think um, I'm the same as Steph. Uh, when I was younger, I was uh, I took it a, a lot more harder. But, um, you know, as you grow older and the more mature you get, you learn, you learn uh, how to deal with it. Uh, I like to uh, do a lot of video analysis on myself. Um, yep. But like Steph said, you know, every professional, it doesn't matter if you're the best in the world or, or, or whatever you're doing, you're going to make a mistake. And I think me, uh, the older that I've gotten, the more mature that I've, I've become is I understand that, that it, it's, um, you're only human, you will make a mistake, but, and um, it's the way you bounce back. Um, you know, I, I can remember this year, I made a mistake in the FA Cup final, uh, but the next game against West United, you know, I, I played well, and, and that's what it's yeah. about. I think you're allowed to make a mistake, but, you know, it's the way you work and the way you you come back from that that, that, that defines you as an athlete. For sure, definitely. Steph, what music have you been listening to lately? Oh. Terrible music. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good question. I have been listening to my game day playlist, actually, because right. I've been doing lots of, um, you know, gym and things on my own. So I've been trying to pump myself up a little in isolation. <laughs> so it's been yeah. hardcore tunes, nothing <laughs> to relax. Uh, as in half of the songs on my playlist are of yours now. Yeah. Ah, uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right, next one we got coming up. I didn't ask about you. Yeah, we go. Yeah. Steph, who are the emerging nations, in your opinion, that will rival the USA slash Matildas? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, Holland. Yeah, that's a good one. To be fair, play, obviously they did as well as they did at the World Cup and made the final. Um, but they've just got some incredible players playing in very big leagues all around the world. So um, them coming together as a national team, they're very good these days. So death, that's a good one. Um, I think England are always up there. Um, as again, incredible players playing in big leagues, doing great things. So probably those two. Yep, very good. Question <laughs> for Vizanis: What is your choice of gloves for games and why? <laughs> uh, definitely Jocker, uh, the best in the business uh, for me. Uh, obviously, know the boys down there. Um, yep. Incredible uh, people to work with. They allowed me to. To build my own glove, a glove that, that, that fits me, and you know, I'll have them for the rest of my career. So, Devante, there you go, mate. <laughs> yeah, All righty. So, on that, let's talk equipment then. So, Steph, what about you? Since since you're obviously a player, is there a particular boot that you have to wear that you've been hooked on, or is whenever something new comes out, you're willing to try it? Uh, well, I'm sponsored by Puma, so I wear the same boot. Um, yep everything and to be honest it's one of the I'm wearing the Puma Future and it's the best thing about it is I don't need to wear it in I as soon as it I take it out of the box I can wear it at training or for a game so yeah that's my choice very good but just um, I'm oh, sorry no go oh yeah um for me obviously I wear the, the, the jocker gloves um and I wear 
Adidas boots. Uh, so you know, jumping on board with Jocker um, for me was important because they're comfortable and and the boots that that uh, the Adidas provide, you know, I think they're the best for me as well. You gave Dina, you gave Europe another crack uh, in the last couple of years when you headed back over to play in Holland. What was sort of the uh, the difference in experience that you had compared to when you were in the UK previously? Yeah, um, you know, going to Holland and being in the top flight in Holland um, was a fantastic experience. Uh, obviously, I'd worked with uh, John Van Schip and Michael Volcanus before uh, at City, um, but to see uh, another country, a different culture, um, you know, it was fantastic. I really enjoyed my time in Holland. Steph came over to visit me a couple of times. Um, I lived in a cool little city called Zwolle, and uh, yeah, for me it was okay. Although I didn't play, um, you know, I still had an amazing experience because I think it made me um, a better footballer too. Because you know, playing with those types of players um, really brings the best out of you. Yeah, very good. So playing with the Dutch, obviously, there's there's a lot you could have learned there. Was there anything you learned that you brought back that you added to your game that maybe they do differently there? Yeah, I think uh, well, Dutch football is very big on. Uh, playing out from the back, uh, possession-based football, uh, and um, being away from England uh, a long time, coming back home where I've worked under different types of managers at Melbourne City. Um, mm -hmm. Michael Volcanus, he was very big on, uh, on on playing out from the back. So then to go back there and, and play with top players that, that, uh, that demand that from you, they want you to keep the ball, um, you, you, you learn new... Uh, how can I explain it? Like phases of, of the game where when to hit the fullback, when not. So for me, yeah. that was a real eye opener because they're very, very good at possession and, and keeping the ball and, and relying heavily on the goalkeeper. Yeah. Steph, we're going to start to wrap it up shortly. But Steph, how would you sort of compare? Like Asia's obviously developing in all forms of the game men's, women's, whatnot. Japan's been sort of considered a leader there. Um, prior to the Matilda sort of coming onto the scene in an advanced sort of stage in the last few years, you guys are really sort of taking over that space. But what do you find very competitive when you play against the Japanese? Yeah, I think, I mean, their technique and what they do on the ball is probably second to none in the women's game and, mm -hmm. I mean, in the men's mm -hmm. game too, but they've always yeah. been probably the best technically Um they're so smart, so disciplined and organised that whenever you play against them, you know it's not going to be easy. I think we dominate them physically, which we've surprised them a few times with some different game plans and the way that we've pressed them and been able to win a couple of games recently. Um, but they're always ready for the next thing. So the next time you play against them, they've got different tactics and different ways of playing around us and dealing with that. And I think that's what makes them as good as they are. They're just so tactically ready for every situation, for every single team that they come up against. Um, so, yeah, we, we have a lot of respect for Japan. Obviously, we've had some some great games against them recently, a um, yep. couple of cup finals. So they're always a good team to play against. So last one each. What What's the future sort of hold? I'll start with you, Dina. What's the plan? I mean, you're now moving along towards the middle part of your career what what do you want to achieve what what more do you want to get out of this this journey that you're on yeah um look i've always had a, a um a goal in my career to to, to play 300 professional uh, appearances i'm around the 150 160 mark uh, at the moment uh, so that's a goal for me um but you know i'm very very happy at melbourne city uh, but at the same time I want to try and get back to Europe and give it that one last crack. Um, you know, I do miss England. Um, I've, I've been, I was there for a long time, in eight years. Um, so to hopefully get noticed and keep playing well and, and have another crack uh, at Europe because I'm 29 now and I'm, I'm at a good age for a goalkeeper to go back, having a bit of experience behind me. Uh, and that, that, that's a, a big goal of mine, to, to, to try to go back to England and uh, work my way up the leagues as, as, as high as I can go. I don't want to sit here and say, oh, I want to play in the Premier League by in five years' time because, you know, it, it, might, it might be unrealistic. But I'd like to take it one step at a time and just look at the near future rather than five, six years on a track. What about yourself, Steph? 
Yeah, at the moment, obviously, with what's been happening, my club situation is a little bit in limbo. But mm -hmm. in terms of my goals, a lot of my thinking revolves around the national team and, um, you know, being with the girls for so long and just have so much belief that we can do something really special with the mm -hmm. girls in this mm -hmm. team. So, um, yeah, a lot of my goals revolve around just being the best I can be for that team um, and trying to do something really special in the next couple of years. Very good. So thanks again for both of you for, for joining us tonight. It's been great to sort of hear your insights and there's a lot of similarities in, in the pathways of a footballer, but there's also lots of details that are different. Um, so it was great to hear your stories and thanks for joining us. No worries. Thanks, thanks. for having us. See you soon. See you later. Bye.